Hi, I'm so excited to be here. I've never been to Strange Loop or a Papers We Love, and I'm a super paper nerd, so this is right down my alley. Um, just a little bit about me. I do tweet a lot about space, Zeeshan. Thank you <laughs> for calling me out on that. I'm pretty obsessed with space. Space! <laughs> um, I'm a hardware hacker, reverse engineer, um, system administrator of many flavors of Unix-based operating systems and specialized in storage clusters for a long time, yada, yada. I'm, I'm an old lady in programming terms, so that means I've done a lot of, worn a lot of hats work-wise. Um, uh, for the last two and a half years, I've uh, started my own company using Kickstarter, so I want to thank all the backers. I've met some of you here today, so I always love meeting backers. Thank you. If you haven't received your stuff yet, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm 36% uh, of the way shipped. That's official numbers. And I knit my 300th scarf. Well, my machine knit my 300th scarf last week. And uh, yeah, I'm in the backer number of the 70s to 80s in the one scarf backer tier. So if that's you, your scarf is coming soon. Um, as a, a small aside about papers, my grandfather, my French grandfather, my name's Fabienne Serrière, which is unpronounceable, so I go by Fobbs. Um, and uh, he uh, was a pluralist engineer, nuclear engineer, audio engineer, amongst other things. And one of my uncles uh, found out about a project I was doing in the early 2000s, when my uncle was still around. And uh, he said, oh, your grandfather did a project like that. And I said, oh, that's interesting. He said, no, with the exact same technology. And I said, that can't be possible. I'm working on negative impedance amplifiers for subwoofers. And he said, no, he used that paper from the early, you know, the 1920s, 1930s. And I said, I used the same paper, and it really freaked me out. <laughs> so I think um, maybe we were genetically programmed to like certain scientific papers, and that's kind of a weird thing. <laughs> Just thought I'd put that out there. I don't know if it's actually true, because that uncle has passed, and uh, my grandfather obviously passed a while ago. So yeah, the scientific papers that are genetically in my DNA that I should like is very strange thing for me to think about. So. Um, this talk should probably be called my illogical obsession with generative seashell patterns and knitting them into one-off items. <laughs> but it's a little long, so I called it knitable seashells. Um, a friend of mine uh, nerd sniped me, thanks XKCD for the term, um, nerd sniped me into this book called The Algorithmic Beauty of Seashells. How many of you have ever opened this book? Oh my goodness. It's slightly out of print, but you can um, still find it. Thank you, online booksellers of weirdness. Um, it was published by Hans Meinot in uh, 1995. And the reason uh, my friend suggested it to me was because uh, seven years ago in 2010, I had hacked a KH930 knitting machine to work with modern computers, and I was trying to knit outputs that were uh, one-off, so generative art that looked good in pixel, pixelized environments. Um, we'll get back to this in a bit, um, but this is one of the ones that I knit on that early machine. This is a wide wrap, so it's kind of like these dimensions. This is a product placement. <laughs> Um, it's not this exact one. These are the ones I currently make. Um, so I'm super into generative knitwear, specifically. And um, I tried generating some stuff from the book, um, but I'm going to come back to this. And it turns out there's lots of papers on generating seashell patterns. Um, Earlier than the book was a paper published in 1992 by one of the same authors, Hans Meinot, and co-written by Deborah Fowler, and I'm going to butcher this, I'm supposedly, I guess, Polish name, Przemyslav. I'm going to butcher it. I'm sorry. Um, 
they wrote a paper as part of SIGGRAPH, so thank you ACM for sponsoring today. I didn't mean, that's not a product placement, that just happened to be part of the papers. Um, and in it, they, this is before the book came out, they show these, uh, there's an actual seashell on the left of these images and on the right is a generated seashell. So they not only generate the, the forms, but they generate the patterns that are on the seashell, which is what I'm particularly interested in. Um, one of the papers that they reference in that paper uh, is pretty old, uh, specifically from 1969, and I was a little weirded out to see that it was a computer simulations of a molluscan pigmentation pattern published in 1969, so I kind of got to researching. So a friend of mine who's a professor, which I am not in academia, managed to get me the paper, and uh, pretty much every seashell, generative seashell, or generative animal pattern paper or book that I found uh, referenced this paper. So I thought it must be pretty important, it's really early. Let's see, what, let's see what this is all about. So it was written in 1968 and published in 1969. Um, the main author is C.H. Waddington or Conrad Hal Waddington and he was uh, a developmental biologist, a geneticist and kind of, I think, coined the term of epigenetics, which is really cool, that's really early. Um, and this is probably not what he looked at the time. This is him a bit younger. Um, he was at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and then, so I, I read the paper and I thought, okay, this is interesting. But then I found a blog post from some librarians at the University of Edinburgh that uh, had an intriguing image that was not in the original paper. And to me, it looked like it was plotted. And I, I was really intrigued by that. And what I found out is that there's an entire archive at the University of Edinburgh just for the notes for this paper in the 60s. So I acquired those notes. <laughs> and um, I'm going to share some really cool stuff from them with you today. Um, first of all, there's a letter in it which uh, seems pretty very early, so it's in the 23rd of February, 1968, and it's from a Dr. Oldfield in the Computer-Aided Design Project, uh, parentheses, Department of Computer Science. We want to look official. Um, I'm very excited that you're coming. Uh, we have now improved the computer scanner, so it is possible to generate the sort of aspects you are interested in more easily. This involves both using an Elliott 4120 and a PDP-7 computer in tandem. <laughs> the problem now, which I think is a still a very modern problem, is to find enough time to program either or both problems. <laughs> it's possible that you might find a suitably inclined student for the summer vacation. <laughs> How times have not changed at all. So uh, within this, there was another letter. Um, this is all in um, archival notes that I retrieved from the University of Edinburgh and um, they're a Creative Commons license, so if any of you would like this archive of notes later, let me know, and I'm happy to share it with you because I already paid the fee. So, <laughs> um, in here is a letter, presumably from Waddington, the, one of the authors on the paper, saying, uh, I don't know how to lay my hands on such a person myself, a student programmer, but I have a little money from which I could pay someone. Um, but if you could find someone, there's some funds available to pay them for two or three months during the summer in 1968. Uh, and then inside, there's a letter informing a Mr. Russell Cow, which is annoyingly close to Russell Crowe, so it's very hard to Google him. <laughs> um, Dear sir, I write to inform you that you've been appointed a temporary assistant in the Department of Genetics. That means this person is the assistant. They don't get an assistant. And... Uh, your appointment is from the 17th of June to the 31st of August, 1968. You will be paid at the rate of 10 pounds per week. That's a little low for the time. I don't know. I mean, 30 pounds per week was probably average wage for the end of the 60s in the UK. So we're talking student wages. <laughs> uh, your precise duties will be described to you by Professor Waddington. Um, I hope you are prepared to accept this appointment. 
So it turns out that Russell Cow is still alive. Um, so he's the co-author on the paper, and he now has a DVD archival company that he started in 2001, and he's on the BBC a lot, and he seems like a generally awesome person. So that's pretty exciting. Um, in the paper, so this is in, in the paper, not in the archival stuff that I retrieved, uh, it talks about a little bit about their setup. And when they say an ICL 4130, that's the same thing as an Elliott. So ICL was um, the parent company of, the, of that stuff. Um, let me find where I was in my notes. The Elliott, oh, I'm not there yet. So the code, code was written in Fortran, um, which they talk about in the paper as well. And I was hoping I would find Fortran snippets in this archival uh, treasure trove. Uh, unfortunately, I did not, so I'm sorry. Um, I did find some other stuff. So I found a description from Russell Cow, who um, describes technically how he uh, programmed the program. And uh, interestingly, he also talks about the intricacies of being able to load the PDP-7, which was just used for the display. So PDP-7 um, in conjunction with a DEC-340, which was a display. And uh, some of the stuff was interactive, some was not. So the, it's kind of cool that he, he goes through and he describes what all the initiation variables are. And it turns out this is all very similar to the algorithmic beauty of seashells, which came out in the 90s. So this is very, very early stuff. It's really kind of amazing. Um, I love this part. On stopping the program, the message end of program is typed on the PDP teletype. So <laughs> end. Um, inside the archival notes are these little snippets, which are ripped off pages from uh, drum feed, which I'm assuming were hooked up to the PDP uh, 7. And these are the setup variables for the various runs of the seashell pattern generation that they were doing. Um, and they are also noted by hand on pencil on the back of images of the um, the DEC 340 CRT that they used. So this is a picture of the CRT, and I think um, what's going on, this isn't in the paper at all. So this, uh, this is like a pre-test one, and I'm guessing it's not done being generated, and that's why there are those gaps in it, I'm guessing. Just to give you a little bit of context, in Elliott 4130, which was introduced in 1965, the paper was written in the summer of 1968 and programmed in 1968. Um, the, the foreground of that is an Elliott 4130, which is a lot of machines there that is all one machine. And um, there were less than 200 built. Um, they were not a, a super famous manufacturer, they're a British manufacturer, and then they had a PDP-7 just hooked up to their display. Um, this PDP-7 is actually up and running in Seattle. So if you want to get online on a PDP-7, you just have to go to the Living Computer Museum in Seattle. I'm not affiliated with them, they're just awesome. Um, what's cool is that this DEC 340 that they had, um, which you can see is that circular looking display, um, which we heard about peripherally in the last talk, um, was also programmed. So it had its own yeah, programming parameters just for the display as well. So if you think working today is difficult, just imagine going back and getting paid 10 pounds a week to generally code everything from scratch, <laughs> just completely everything, the whole world. So this is, uh, just to put it in context, um, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie wrote the first Unix kernel on a PDP-7, but in 1969. So this is before that, <laughs> and uh, definitely before Unix was, you know, well spread around. Everything was written and programmed in Fortran, pretty much, in this tool chain that they were using. Um, what's cool is that uh, Russell Cow, the programmer student, was... <laughs> Also, notes in his notes. These are. This is not in the final paper. 
he says, uh, it was important to find a reliable random number generator. How the times have still not changed. <laughs> the one used was adapted from an algorithm in communications of the ACM, January 1967, page 40. A test was carried out to find the frequency with which each integer from 1 to 100 was generated and the results considered satisfactory. <laughs> so we're, we're still, we still have the same problems that this many years later. Um, I like this little note later where he says, the results and displays may be plotted on the CalComp, but in view of the time required, photography is more efficient. And I thought, what the heck is a CalComp? <laughs> well, this is a CalComp. Um, what they probably had was a CalComp 565, which was introduced in 1959. It's a pen plotter. Um, it was also programmed in Fortran. I have a little video to show you. So this is an enthusiast on YouTube who I do not know, who has set up a CalComp 565. I'm going to jump forward a little bit. <laughs> so yes, I could see how it would be quite slow to perhaps output your seashell-generated design. Come on, draw the curve. I'm jumping forward here. Yay! <laughs> so in a f you know five minutes, it can plot a sine wave, which is pretty cool. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of neat. Um, you don't have to take pictures of slides with uh, URLs because I'll give you a. a a link dump at the very end that has all of them in it. Just, I should have told you that at the beginning. Sorry if you're wasting your time. Um, but what's cool is that the CalComp was also programmed um, and has a pretty cool uh, reference documentation just for, <laughs> just for programming the, the CalComp. So I can imagine this poor student, Russell Cow, going, oh my god, what have I gotten myself into for this three months to help this biology professor? But Seems pretty neat. Um, what's cool is that there are various little notes um, that are separated on different little pages here. Uh, I like this, this number two bullet point, 25 or 50 arcs. Um, it, it, he describes basically what he's written into his code. So even though there isn't any of the Fortran that survived, our, the code has definitely bit rotted in this case. Um, there's, you know, he definitely describes exactly what's going on, and it's um, very, very similar to what's in the algorithmic beauty of seashells later. What I also found interesting is that in the scanned archival notes, you, they have similar outputs, but they're not the ones that were used in the final paper. The, none of the ones in the final paper are in the notes that I procured. So they must have done quite a few outputs, um, here on the left, you see the paper, and on the right, you see a plotted on the CalComp, probably took an hour, um, generated seashell design that is drawn out with that funky little plotter. And, <laughs> and next here, so you see one where they change the angles, but this is also not the same as figure three. So these are also different. So I don't know, I don't know. The original ones have gone the way of the dinosaur and they're no longer with us. Um, I'm gonna jump a little bit sideways here. So I kinda, I went down this huge rabbit hole with this paper and I was super excited about it, but um, what the heck does that have to do with knitting? You're probably gonna think about that has nothing to do with knitting. Um, first, I'm gonna kind of tell you what a knitting machine is. Um, it's a series of, knitting itself is a series of loops that are created uh, from nothing, from a raw thread, so a, a raw yarn. So one single thread creates that first row of loops and then the following row gets connected into that and then the following row gets connected into the previous row. 
So uh, the way a knitting machine does this is that it has a series of these needles, usually hundreds of them, that grab the loop and pull it through the last loop. So you, you can imagine them all lined up. So my machine that I have currently has 699 needles on the front bed in a 50 inch span, and they all do this same action. Um, because we don't have time for it today, and I know many people like to hear about the history of computing and jacquard looms that are not knitting machines, um, I gave a big talk about that, and um, you can watch that later. Uh, so back to this book, this beautiful book. Um, it's, it, I've been obsessed with it for a while. <laughs> so when Zishan said I could talk about it, I said, yeah, let's do it. Um, the way that it works is that, um, how many of you took partial differential equations? <laughs> how many of you hated partial differential equations? Me too, I really hated it. I have a math degree and I think I'm just allergic to partial differential equations. It turns out these seashells are done with partial differential equations. Um, I'm gonna spare you, I'm not gonna put any equations up on the slides today because that's how nice of a mathematician I am. And, um, but it, it works through what they call an activator inhibitor system um, that Meinart and a co-contributor in the 70s came up with on how the pigments are laid down by enzymes along the leading edge of the seashell. And those are affected by water, they're affected by temperature, they're affected by the natural phenomenon that are around um, as to whether or not a pixel or a piece of the seashell gets pigmented or not. And so um, in the book, they describe this beautifully. So you're welcome to go get your own copy because it's a wonderful book. Um, the book also comes with software. This particular revision of the book comes with a floppy disk. <laughs> um, some later revisions come with a CD-ROM, and I had a version like that, but I lent it out and I currently don't have it. Um, luckily, I copied all the software off the CD-ROM, so I'm ahead of the curve. Um, the CD-ROM contains uh, basic code in the language basic. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't compile in any modern or vintage basic compiler that I could find. <laughs> and this was in October of 2012 when I was primarily so obsessed that I was willing to deal with crying over other people's software. Um, so this is a good five years ago and uh, all I was able to use was the built-in uh, executable that was the already chunked binary. And so that um, runs a program that looks a lot like this. It has uh, the generative imagery that trickles down the screen. And then it has uh, the setup variables. You can kind of turn them on or off. So in this image, you, you can see I've turned, I can show you what the, initiation variables are. So these are the various, the various parameters you can change for this particular seashell design. And what's cool about this book is that, I don't know how many, but over 50 scientifically named seashells are modeled. So it's not just this particular one, which is Symbiola vespertilio, or the bat volute, which I had never heard of, but looks really cool. Um, but it's really kind of stuck because it's all in this basic compiler and uh, there's no output from the program. So I had to essentially screenshot this static image and then mux it into something that I could use in my, at the time, uh, hacked consumer knitting machine. So this is the first one I knit from stuff I generated from the book back in 2012. Um, so it's a two color, two color piece of knitting. Uh, you can't see this, but the back of this has stripes because my hacked consumer knitting machine had a smart bed and a dumb bed. So one that's microcontroller controlled where I upgraded the hardware and made it talk to a modern computer and then a fully mechanical double bed that had a set of levers that you can set to checkerboard or stripe or double stripe and that's about it. So the back, you can't, you can't affect the back. Whereas with a um, industrial machine, you can have the opposite colors on the back from the front. 
So it's just not, it's not really possible on a uh, hacked consumer knitting machine. So this is, I was pretty proud of this. This took me seven hours by hand because the machine is a hand crank. So it's, it's hacked, but it's not motorized. And uh, the last row, um, so it can't bind off, it can't do the last row, so you knit some waste yarn on the end, and then you hand stitch finish the end with, with what is called a sewn tubular bind off. Any knitters in the house? Sewn tubular bind offs, really finicky and slow, especially at this stitch density. Um, so it took me three to four hours to bind these off. And I made a second one. This is the second one modeled by a friend of mine. Um, and I was, I was really excited about it. I was ecstatic about it. Um, but I, I couldn't sell these as a product or make them for anyone because they were so time consuming. So the machine I had hacked was from 1981. It expected a floppy drive. And it had a maximum pixel memory space of 200 by 66 pixels. The needle bed is 200 long. So that image got sliced into seven chunks of 66 pixels or less to be able to fit into the memory size. And then I had to knit them backwards um, and make sure to load in the images in the right order. So part of that was being able to hack the button matrix on the machine itself and adding uh, basically an Arduino that could control the, press the buttons for me to make sure that I loaded things in the right order because it was really kludgy. And uh, this all came about because of a project that I did with um, Travis Goodspeed and Arian Sharpness in Amsterdam uh, in 2010 called Multi-Threaded Banjo Dinosaur Knitting Adventure 2D Extreme, which is very Googleable. Um, and our code is still alive and our that stuff. But if you want to go down this road, so say you get inspired today and you want your own hacked consumer knitting machine, I don't recommend going the way that I did because now there are many open source projects that um, target uh, 80s consumer knitting machines. Um, and the one you should get is uh, Evil Mad Science Labs, All Yarns Are Beautiful. And you should get a KH910. And so a lot of people ask me this because apparently I'm the expert now and I don't didn't ask to be, but that's the one you want to get. It's much cheaper. You're all in for under, under 500 bucks. Don't run the carriage over the needles until you change the sponge bar. And if you don't know what that is, that's fine. You can ask me later. <laughs> um, so this, I, I was super excited with this. You know, even though it was super kludgy and I could, you know, I was screenshotting the images from something where I couldn't, uh, I couldn't even determine how wide the generation was. Um, it was a fixed pixel width and um, that was baked into that baked in basic. Uh, and I was still super stoked with this because I had, I had outputs. And this was my dream to be able to have generative outputs. So these are three different um, generations, even with the same starting row. Um, so the same initial starting row, but different initial conditions and a random number generator baked, well, pseudo random number generator baked in um, means that you get a different output every time and you don't get repetition in length. So you could make these as long as you wanted, as long, you know, the Turing endless tape, as long as you have endless yarn, um, you could just knit forever. And it would never repeat. And they're all different, but they look similar, and it made me very happy. Um, what else did I want to say about this? That's it. So <laughs> that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, Fast forward to two and a half years ago, I, um, I got one of these. So I want to specifically thank all of my backers, all my Kickstarter backers who've stuck with me in the long haul because two and a half years is a really long time. In Kickstarter years, not that long, but it still feels like an eternity to me. And so thank you for being your patience and cheering me on um, in this folly. <laughs> of a pursuit to make one-off generated knitwear. Um, this is in January of last year. So January of 2016, I received this. This is in Seattle, which is where I live and will be living because I now have a 2,800 pound industrial knitting machine. <laughs> <laughs> this is a CMS 530 HP 7.2 gauge industrial knitting machine, if that means anything to you. Um, it is a 2009 model, so it's a used, 
a used machine from Stoll, a German company. Um, Stoll and Shimaseki together have about 90% of the flat, industrial flat knitting market, so it was either this one or the other one. I, I chose correctly. <laughs> I bought it sight unseen. I went and trained on it for two months in the south of Germany. Um, it's in German because the English class was full. I was very motivated. So this has been quite, <laughs> quite the journey. This is what it looks like knitting and sounds like a little snippet. Um, that, of course, is a Rule 110 scarf, so this has nothing to do with seashells. Um, how many of you know why Rule 110 is important? Some people. It's the only rule of the elementary cellular automata, which is this group of one-dimensional cellular automata that has been proven to be Turing complete. Um, and that is the other paper that I was going to talk about today. So that's Matt Cook's paper on uh, Turing completeness of Rule 110. I highly recommend you read it. It's 40 pages of awesomeness. And um, what's cool is that he proved that these forms that move across the background, when they cross, then you have enough building blocks to build a universal computer. So the image itself is complex enough to compute. So you can have a Turing complete scarf or wrap. <laughs> because why not? Um, Back to the algorithmic beauty of seashells, the book that we were talking about. Um, I generated, I was super into this particular pattern from uh, Clayton Wallianiensis, I can't pronounce Latin names, um, which is this seashell. So if you can see the pattern on the seashell, some people are like, oh, it looks like shark's teeth. What are you talking about seashells? I'm like, no, that's the pattern on the seashell. So it's hard to explain to people without having the actual seashell in front of them. Um, so these are some of the generations I did with the built-in, baked-in code. Um, these are from October 2012. Uh, I wasn't able to knit these because you may notice there are three color images, not two color images like the other ones. And now that I have a three-system industrial knitting machine, I can knit that. <laughs> That is how my office sounds every day, <laughs> um, much louder. So I usually have headphones in. If you come visit me, knock loudly on the door or wave your arms so that I know that you're there. <laughs> um, I, I now cohabitate with a 3,000 pound industrial machine. I'm a factory of one, it's just me and the machine. Um, but I'm able to produce these uh, seashell, generative seashell knitwear. These are blankets. Um, these are two different outputs, three different outputs, I think, even there. Um, the back, you have to kind of choose. So when, when you have two colors in knitting, uh, who, who's hand knitters here? Okay, who knows what double knitting is? Double knitting is when you have the opposite colors on the back from the front, and you have apparently knit stitches to both sides, so you have a non-curling fabric. Um, knitting machines do that really well. Um, it's kind of a fiddly, time-consuming thing that you fo follow a chart by hand. It's not my favorite hand knitting. I like doing like Estonian lace and weird things like that. But um, in machine knitting, uh, it, turns, it turns out to be very easy. And so you have this fully reversible, non-curling fabric that's smooth on both sides. Um, doesn't have to be sewn together. Um, it almost comes out of the machine like this. Um, it comes out of the machine with some waste yarn and some threads that I have to sew in and that kind of stuff. But it's fully reversible when you have two colors, and that's a property of knitting. When you move up to three colors, you have to decide what to do on the back. And so this is one of the infills. Um, you can't really tell because it's not super up close, but it's, a, it's sort of a checkerboard infill of the two colors that aren't being used on the front on the back. So when you have green on the front side, on the back you have a checkerboard of black and white. Um, this is important because I have a three-system machine, which means it can do three operations in one pass. I bet you never thought that knitting machines were this computationally interesting. Um, it can do three operations in one pass. So when you move to four, five, or six colors, those take the same amount of time as each other, but they take double the amount of time as one, two, or three colors. 
when you're talking about double bed jacquard, which is what double knitting is called in machine language, uh, machine knitting parlance. Um, if you can kind of see here that there's some problems with the resolution, um, if you get up close here, how up close do I get? Very up close. Um, you can see here that there's parts where it looks like it's overly, overly pixelated where, you know, a square of four knit stitches is one pixel. And then there's some spots where it's one pixel to one knit stitch. So it's, um, this is, this is a problem where I couldn't get the exact data out of the algorithmic beauty of seashells because I'm screenshotting images that are in a fixed width that is not pixel matching to what I'm doing on the knitting machine. So that's the crux of my problem. It took me a little while to get around to it, but now you understand my problem. Um, it turns out I'm not alone. Uh, I'm not the only one obsessed with seashell generation in 2017. Um, I feel much better about it because I was really worried <laughs> that it might be a condition that I should have checked out. Um, Francesco de Comité um, has published a few papers on this because um, he is interested in uh, 3D printing seashells that are generated um, with the patterns on them. So those are 3D printed with the patterns generated, and the 3D shape is also generated, and it's all 3D print on the 3D printer, which is pretty freaking amazing. Um, what's cool about, at the end of his paper, um, he mentions, programming a seashell is not complicated. It requires only some 300 lines of Python program. And I was like, what? What about this baked in basic code? <laughs> Um, it turns out that um, Francesco has shared um, some of his code with me, and that is what I'm going to be working with in the future. So these are all of the links from the talk from today, and um, you can take a picture of this slide, and then you'll get all of the links, um, including some things that weren't linked, like the, where some of the images came from. I link those and everything, too. Um, thank you so much.